Let's begin by singing in this harvest season for the fruit of all creation. Voices United 227. Please be seated. Good morning. I guess not all people who got a ticket Friday night took up on the two for one deal. I'm Stacy Mortson, minister here at Trinity Centennial United Church in Rosemont, and we welcome you warmly to worship this morning. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or whether you are watching at home later today. Know that near or far, you are a part of this beloved community. After the service today, we will have an educational session to which all members of the congregation are invited. We will have a video presentation and discuss remit number one, which proposes establishing an autonomous national indigenous organization within the United Church. Now, regardless of whether you are a member of the coordinating council, you are urged to listen in, to ask questions, to understand why we're talking about this and what the implications might be to, for our church. It's a step towards right relations. The governing body will have a vote, but all members are included in the educational session. Uh, last week I showed you this great little devotional book, uh, Reverend Sung Ming, uh, Jung of St. John's has celebrated 25 years of ministry and so he compiled a book of 25 years of his favorite sermons. Uh, the whole book is $20 all in and he is donating 100% of the sales to St. John's Benevolent Fund which helps out folks in need in our local community. It's got nice big letters so you can even read it in bed without your glasses on. So we had a great time Friday night, but now John is going to share a few words with us. Good 
wow, what a show, what a band, what an audience, and what a great bunch of volunteers to make it happen. I want to thank everybody that helped in any way, uh, the many people that helped sell tickets, uh, the, all the people who helped uh, clear out all the stuff you see up here, not just the furniture, but the boxes of choir books and all the beautiful decorations had to be taken out on Thursday and put back in yesterday. And uh, the, the guys who park cars and run the elevator, and, uh, speaking of parking cars, uh, the uh, floodlights for the uh, uh, parking lot were provided at no cost by Scott McPherson of uh, North America Construction. And of course, most of all, thank the ladies who, uh, who provided the food. Uh, you may not realize it, but the band guys were here before 2 o'clock in the afternoon carrying in all the massive amounts of sound equipment and instruments that they had and uh, setting it up and uh, doing sound checks and so on. So uh, naturally, we had to give them supper. And, uh, and then afterwards, well, we couldn't send all those people home without inviting them downstairs for some refreshments and fellowship. So uh, uh, Tracy and Isabel fed the band and uh, Joan Canning, pretty much single-handed, provided that amazing assortment of uh, goodies downstairs. So uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, by the way, speaking of Joan and Isabel, between the two of those ladies, they sold over 70 tickets. So uh, that was wonderful too. Um, we had several donations of cash uh, to help with the fund. And, um, one of them being the, uh, the oldest member of the band, 92-year-old uh, Carl Watson, he, he turned back in his uh, fee for the night to help. And, uh, and uh, speaking of, uh, of money, uh, this is just preliminary, but uh, after paying the band and the posters and whatever, um, it appears that we have about $2,500 profit on the evening. So, uh, So thanks again, everybody. So just one week after stuffing ourselves with stuffing, we recognize World Food Day, a time to reflect on the global, global crisis of hunger and highlight sustainable solutions. <clears throat> the world is hungrier than ever in 2023 with children in poverty among the most vulnerable. According to the World Food Program, as many as 828 million people go to bed chronically hungry every night. And extreme weather, rising costs and conflict continue to worsen the global food crisis. We look at food sovereignty, which is about empowering people farmers and eaters to make the important decisions about food and agriculture. So if you were looking at the quiz on Friday, those were your answers. 828 million people go hungry and food sovereignty is a condition where people define their own food and agricultural systems to produce healthy and culturally appropriate food through ecologically sound, sustainable methods. The concept of food sovereignty values food providers, localizes food systems, builds knowledge and skills, and works with nature. Hunger is not something that happens way over there, somewhere. Joanne is going to update us on what we learned at the UCW meeting on this past Tuesday about local hunger. Good morning, everyone. This past Tuesday, we welcomed Jamie Karsh to our UCW me meeting as our guest speaker. And Jamie is the executive director of the Alliston Food Bank. Um, so I'm going to give you some of the details and some stats that uh, Jamie shared with us. The food bank itself is located at 52 Wellington Street West, and it serves the areas of Agela, Tazerontio, Alliston, Baxter, and Cookstown. 
Anyone who lives in those areas is eligible for food assistance from the Alliston Food Bank, and there is no need to provide any proof of income. The food bank itself has 75 volunteers. Last December, the Alston Food Bank was serving 297 households. Today, that number has increased 90% to 565 households. The high cost of food and housing are the main reasons for people needing help. But there are also clients who unexpectedly lost their jobs and have to make the decision as to whether to pay rent or to buy food. So the food bank itself is operated like a grocery store where individuals can choose what, is ne what they need. Their food shopping is by points. And based on their uh, um, household number, they get a certain number of points to, to spend. So a single 35-year-old uh, woman would get about 35 points per week. A recently acquired refrigerated van has been a blessing to the food bank. You may have seen it about town. The, numbers of the, the names of the sponsors on, of the van are incorporated into the wrap on the outside of the vehicle. And the van allows food to be received from grocery stores through the food rescue program, where foods that, are, that might be slightly damaged or slightly stale dated in grocery stores are collected and not wasted. 66,000 pounds of food has been acquired through this program so far this year. The food bank is financed, financed mostly by grants and donations. The provincial and federal governments do not provide support. The town of Alliston does cover the rent for the Alliston Food Bank. Donations were very high during COVID, but are now going down. And sometimes the donors are now users, which shows how quickly things can change. Donations are always welcome, especially during the summer and into the fall when donations tend to dwindle. And the financial donations are used to purchase perishable items such as milk, eggs, fresh fruit, and vegetables, among other things. The Allison Food Bank works with other food banks in the area to share surplus items and resources. They also work with other charitable organizations in Allison, such as the Allison Attic and the Clothesline. So Jamie's presentation, of course, led us to talk about food banks in general and also to consider other means by which food insecurities can be combated. Um, at our meeting, 98 pounds of food was donated um, by the UCW women. And that was excellent. And, and thank you very much for those of you who brought some food in for the food bank. So I'll just leave you with these stats. These are uh, stats about Canada. Um, our population is 38.24 million. About 1.2 million people, which is 3%, use food banks. However, approximately 6 million people, or 15% of Canadians, are in fact food secure, insecure. So it is not a problem that does not exist in Canada. It does, in fact, exist here. So something to think about. Thank you very much. Food is sacred, and it is of a spiritual concern to us, as demonstrated throughout the scriptures, where our relationship with God is intrinsically wound, physically and metaphorically, with the way God nurtures and provides for us. God provides in abundance. There is enough for all. It's how we distribute this abundance that requires our prayerful consideration. So now let's take a moment to enter into this time of worship, daring to call upon the name of God to be with us by breathing God's holy name, inhaling, <gasps> exhale, way, and know that each breath you take is indeed a whispered prayer. With thankful hearts, we gather here where the doors are wide open to all. We come with open hearts and open minds, thankful that we are children of the light of Christ, humbled by God's presence in our midst this morning.
So now we'll say our territorial acknowledgement and you'll see the theme woven into that as well. We acknowledge this sanctuary is located on the treaty lands and traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples, including the Adawa, the Ojibwa, and the Potawatomi nations known together as the Three Fires Confederacy. Rosemont is covered by the Lake Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty Number 18, signed in 1818 with the Chippewa Nation. Today, as we discover justice in the guise of food sovereignty, may we in turn accept our responsibility to honor all our relations while praying that we may move forward in the spirit of relationship, reconciliation, and respect for all. And we'll do our call to worship responsively. So you'll repeat the bolded parts, the white parts. We come to worship creator God who created us in goodness. In the midst of the evils and greed of the world, we come to be reminded of good. We come to worship holy God who created a world of abundance. In a world where people choose to see only scarcity, we come to be reminded of God's abundance. We come to worship our loving God who created a world for peace and compassion. When we see or experience hunger and violence, we come to be shown the way to peace and healing. Come, let us worship God. And pray with me now. Good and gracious God, you are gathering this community from across the earth, asking us to pour out our lives on behalf of those who hunger for hope, for justice, for daily bread. You are asking us to see the earth as you do, so very, very good. Trees with fruit, bursting with seed, green plants for food, for humans, and for every living creature, as a holy place for everything that breathes and to whom you have given life. Yet we see the realities before us, and it takes our breath away. Those whose bellies growl every day, those who consume more than their fair share, breathe new life into us. As a global community, as local congregations gather us together so that we may remind each other of your intent for this earth. Gather us so that we may pour out our lives in Christ's name as Christ does on behalf of those who hunger. Amen. Hmm. I wonder, have you ever been really hungry? I mean, really, really hungry. I wonder what that feels like. What do you do when you're hungry? You probably just go to the cupboard or the fridge and you grab a snack. I wonder what would happen if you didn't have any food to eat at your house. Well, I have a little bag of tricks here with some things to teach us about how we can make food sovereignty for all people. It's my lovely clergy tartan bag that you presented me with. I have a few things in here. Let's see, what do I have? Oh, I have a little lamb. How do you think that might help with food hunger? Well, not only would uh, giving a gift of a lamb to somebody through a program like Gifts with Vision, and as you start your Christmas shopping, I have brand new catalogs, for gifts with vision. If you were to give a community a little lamb, it provides not only meat for the people, but also animals to begin harvesting more regularly, giving wool that can then be made into things as a, as a way of providing funds for people to sustain themselves. Sustainable. We're looking at sustainable things. What else do I have in my bag? Some yarn and a crochet hook. 
I always have yarn and knitting needles or a crochet hook nearby. How might that be something that helps provide sustainability? Anyone? Projects to sell, right. So if you're in an indigenous community somewhere, say Mexico, and we, we provide goods for them to make crafts, local crafts, then that would be a way to increase funding for, their, for themselves to earn a living and feed their families. A gardening tool. Community garden, that's a great one. I think St. John's has a bit of a community garden, don't they? Yeah, we could, maybe we could consider something like that here with a great big yard that we have. We could maybe do something like that to help people grow their own food for sustainability. Oh, banana. So purchasing things that come from faraway countries, being careful about who you purchase from. <clears throat> in order to make sure that we're doing fair trade things. A book. It says practical astronomy, but that's, that's irrelevant <laughs> to the conversation. Uh, what do books do for us? Teach us how to do things. So providing education, providing for schools, providing literacy for people to be able to earn and learn so that they can work their way out of poverty. I think I have one more thing in here. Oh. It's a coin. Look, what, are, what do coins represent? Funding, yeah, money, and how we can make donations. And as we learned on Tuesday, that it's not just about charity, it's about Funding to help people get off the ground so that charity is no longer required, that they can learn and grow their own food and be responsible for their things. But sometimes we need a hand up in programs to get people started. So the dollar represents funding. Oh, and I have some snacks if anybody's hungry. <laughs> Say bye. If you get bored during the service, you can come and start crocheting something. And so now we're going to have our first hymn, and it's called All Who Hunger from Voices United.
God is good. All the time. As we prepare to hear the scriptures, which Mary Foster will share with us this morning, let's sing our hymn, Listen, Listen, God is Calling. scripture reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 25 verses 1 to 9. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of foreigners is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. A shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of foreigners like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, The Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, And the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, See, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to invite Jane and Joanne and Wendell forward to uh, set us up for a little uh, coffee shop. We're going to have a little coffee shop discussion here. So imagine you're just walking down the street in Pembroke and these folks are out having a cup of coffee in front of one of the shops downtown. Coffee and cookie. Mm, yummy. I'm so glad they serve fair trade coffee here now. Yes, it's good to know that our caffeine addiction is at least helping people in other parts of the world earn a decent living. Right, now they just have to come up with a fair trade cookie and we'll be all set. <laughs> Did you say fair trade cookie? What would that be? Well, it's not really anything. We were just joking around. Oh, where I live, we don't uh, talk about fair trade. It's not a thing. We grow most of our food ourselves, and what we don't grow, we buy locally from uh, others. Wow, that's hard to imagine. It takes a lot of big farms and a lot of transportation to put a whole meal on my dining table. Our local farmer's market is becoming really popular, and you can get many different foods from local family farms. 
especially during the summer, so not everything comes from far away. Yes, but we still buy and eat a wide variety of foods in every season of the year. I guess that isn't the reality elsewhere. Why don't you join us, Stacy? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jacob Stacy. Somebody wasn't reading her script very well. <laughs> I'm a member of La Via Campesina. It's a global movement that brings together peasants, small scale farmers, and agricultural workers from all around the world. We are 200 million farmers in 73 countries. We promote social justice and dignity through small-scale, sustainable agriculture and food production. And judging by your coffee choice, it looks like you care about social justice and dignity too. Absolutely. But I don't really know much about where most of my food comes from or who grows it. There must be some serious issues if 200 million of you have a global movement. Would I know any members? Well, I don't know. We represent half of the world's population that produces 56% of the world's food. We farm using sustainable methods that not only feed people, but also nourish the planet. In Canada, the National Farmers Union is a member of La Via Campesina. I've heard of the National Farmers Union. What brings you together with them? We are all working together for something we call food sovereignty. This includes things like the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food, to define their own food and agricultural systems, and to preserve local small-scale food systems and the environment. For us, the well-being of the people who produce and eat the food should be at the heart of the food systems rather than the interests of markets and corporations. We recognize food as being sacred. Those food sovereignty principles and values sound a bit like the things we talk about at church. I can see that they may not fit with big industrial farms. However, they should be easily doable for small farmers, shouldn't they? Yes, they should. However, we are constantly challenged by cheap imports and control of our lands, territories, water, seeds and livestock is being taken over by the corporate sector. We see food sovereignty as our best response to our current struggles with food, poverty, and the climate crisis. My grandparents farmed. It was a hard and busy life. I can't imagine how you find time to work on these issues when the basic f work of farming is hard enough. It is hard work. And it is the work that people have done for thousands of years. But we have no choice. If we, the poorest people in the world, who feed most of the world are to survive and prevent starvation in our own communities, we need to be able to locally control our land, water, seeds, and finances. We need to ensure that female and male farmers have equal rights. We need to support and build new local food systems and markets. Hmm. And we need to protect our communities and our future by using ecological farming methods. That's a lot to take in. I care about those issues too, and I'd like to help. Is there something specific we could do? What would you say, should our priority be here in Canada? Well, food sovereignty is important, but it's hard for some people to understand and even harder to implement. Food Secure Canada is an organization you might connect with that can help you with both. The United Church is a member of Food Secure Canada, which is one of the church's m and partners. Did you know that the United Church is already involved in food sovereignty work through the mission and service? Really, how? Well, there's something called conservation agriculture. This is the type of farming that is most likely to protect and improve the soil and also improve the success of crops in extremes like drought or flooding. Weather extremes are more common now with climate change. In poor parts of the world, Crop success is a matter of life and death. We know that conservation farming is the most reliable method for crop success, especially for small farmers like me. However, most agricultural subsidies from wealthy countries push us towards technological methods with chemicals that we have to purchase and seeds that we can't own. And that's not conservation agriculture. 
But where does the United Church come into this? The United Church of Canada and the Canadian Food Grains Bank support conservation agriculture projects in places like Zimbabwe. These projects help improve soils, save lives by providing more food, and can even help lift people out of poverty by giving them a surplus to sell at local markets. Wow, I bet my mission and service contributions are supporting that. Yes, they are, and thank you. Your mission and service contributions are like seeds planted on good soil, just like the parables. Jesus liked to use seeds as metaphors to teach about many things, like the kingdom of God, the power of small things, the sowing of seeds on good soil and bad soil. And the other parts of the Bible talk about food too. I'm thinking of that time when the people were lost in the wilderness and God sent them something called manna for them so they wouldn't starve. Yes, I remember that. I think the thing that stayed with me from that story was the idea that every day they would have enough to eat, not too much and not too little. It required faith that there would be food every morning and food was recognized as a gift from God that would be there for everyone. And there's that story from Isaiah where God provides a banquet on a mountaintop of many fine foods and rich wines for the poor and the needy. I find it interesting that you said that one of the principles of food sovereignty is that food is sacred. In our Christian tradition, we often sit together and share food. You mean at our church potluck suppers? <laughs> well, no, I mean, that, yes, we do that too, Jane, but I was referring to the act of communion, where we share bread and wine. It's a sacred practice, something that we share with Christians around the world. Everyone is welcome and equal when we break bread together. Maybe the next time you share bread and wine together, you will also think of the farmers who grew the food and the millions of people in the world who also share your sacred sense about food. Before you go, can you tell us what we are doing here? I mean, we've enjoyed talking with you. We don't usually run into farmers like you at the coffee shop. <laughs> well, you know, farmers are everywhere. We are behind, they are behind, we are behind <laughs> that cookie that you're eating right now, behind the coffee that you're drinking. We are even behind the fuel that you may put in your car. If you want to learn more, talk with a local farmer and discover what issues are concerns for her or him in your area. Or if you can't find a farmer, have a conversation with your food instead. You know, ask your food where it's from, <laughs> what its experience has been in getting to your table. And, you know, Grandma Google may have to help you fill in the blanks. And Then think about some of the principles of food sovereignty, things like localized food systems, ecological balance, putting people first, local decision making, sacred aspects of food. Think about where your food fits within these principles and think about God's promises to us. That's a lot to think about. Yes, and look at the amount of food we waste every day. Wow, it gets pretty complicated when you start thinking about food and our relationships around it. Yeah. Here, these packets contain many little miracles, little seeds. Why don't you carry one in your pocket? It's simple, yet complicated, just like our conversation today. And remember these seeds. It has the potential to grow and do great things, just like you. The end. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> and now we have a really special surprise for you. So Jean will play the members of the choir forward.
<laughs> There's no room for them to sit. <laughs>
oh, thank goodness I had a moment to collect myself before we get into the affirmation. That's, I don't know if it sounded wonderful up there, but it sure sounded wonderful up here being in the midst of it. So we'll repeat our affirmation of faith together. We dare to dream of a world in which hunger is unknown, where scarcity is an illusion, and everyone has a place at the table. We dare to dream of a world in which generosity is the norm, where greed finds no foothold, and there is more than enough for all. We dare to dream of a world in which love rules, where compassion is the first response, and there is no place for bigotry. We dare to dream. We dare to pray. We dare to believe. Amen. And there is no shortage of ways that we can help to heal God's world and all God's children. We just need the willingness to see them and the courage to act. We can use the abilities and resources that God has blessed us with for the sake of those who need them. Our gifts to the church are used both locally and further afield through the Mission and Service Fund. Our offerings will now be received. Let's pray together. God of mercy, the gifts we bring are so small in comparison to the vast needs in our world. They are nowhere near enough to save the thousands who are dying of starvation and malnutrition, or even to meet the needs of the hungry and homeless in our area. Yet we come with open hands and open hearts, bringing what we can hoping that our gifts will be multiplied through your great love so the hungry may receive all they need and more. Amen. And as we enter into prayer, we'll sing our opening chorus together. Lord, listen to your children praying. Creator of all that is, all that has ever been, and all that will ever come. In the season that we know in the North as autumn, we offer gratitude for the cycle of the seasons. In this season, we begin to reap what we have sown, tended to, prayed over, fretted upon. In all of this, we know that you have been there, watching over your creation and all its creatures. Thank you. Holy One, we lament over crops that were lost this year, to drought and hail and floods, to frost, to lack of workers. We lament over crops that were never planted, where farmers could not access their land or do not have the privilege to acquire land. Help us to stand in solidarity with farmers whose harvest never came to yield. Help us to see land not as a resource to be used, but as a gift to share. As the leaves begin to turn brilliant reds, oranges, and yellows, we begin to pull from the ground the fruit of our labor, the potatoes, squash, beets, 
cabbage, apples, pears, and more fill our baskets. We give thanks to you, God of abundance. The corn and the beans are ready to be stored. They have been dried on their stalks. We know that these foods will sustain us through the coming winter. Heavenly parent of all Earth's children, we give thanks for laborers who have come to this harvest, workers from near and far, many who travel to this land to find work. You, who lost your own child, open our eyes to their sacrifice and help us to honor their gift. We pray for a safe harvest for all laborers and farmers. As the honeybee prepares for the winter, we enjoy honey's sweet ne nectar. As the broiler chicken is fully grown, we give thanks for its life that will sustain us. As the hunter patiently awaits the deer, we honor its gift as our nourishment. Creator God, we are called back to remembrance of our interconnectedness during this harvest season. Forgive us the times that we have been disconnected from our relations in our desire to make more than we should. Call us back into the fabric of creation so that we might live in the abundance of life. For all this and more, we give thanks. Prince of Peace, help us to remember that peace comes only when all are fed when there is no disparity of resources among your children. We pray especially today for the people of Israel and Palestine and ask that your children there remember who they are and whose they are as your son who became incarnate in that land taught them many, many years ago. Remind us too, great physician, that food is medicine and health is a sacred gift. We pray for all who are suffering from illness and are in need of physical and spiritual nourishment. We ask you to sustain their caregivers as well. Heavenly Spirit, our lives are filled with many concerns as well as with many thanks for all you have provided. We are most thankful that you, Divine One, listen in earnest to the prayers on each one of our hearts. And so hear our personal prayers, gracious God. Listen as we dare to speak our deepest cares with sighs too deep for words into this time of silence. We continue to pray, Mother and Father of us all, daring to say together the words Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our going out hymn is Voices United 519, Sing to the Lord of Harvest.
So now we can have a quick little bio break, wet your whistle, and then we invite you to come back. If you want to sit on this side, we'll be having uh, some videos that will answer some questions about the remit. So grab uh, a coffee and, and make your way back up here if you're interested in the Autonomous D Indigenous Organization. We trust your time here has been a blessing to you as your presence here has been a blessing to each one of us. I really want to thank Jean and the hard work she did with that amazing choir this morning. And now my friends, as you leave this time of worship, may the blessing of God, creator of heaven and earth, rest upon you and all that God has made. May the risen Christ Jesus transform your life and your vision so that you may live in reconciliation with all things. And may the power of the Holy Spirit move over this whole earth like the breath of spring to renew the earth and all its people so that creation may join together in praise to God's holy name this day and every day. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>